morning. It is uh, good to see everybody. Good to see the uh, balcony crew there. Uh, I want to start today uh, by asking you a question, and it's a question uh, that you honestly may have never thought about, or it's probably a question that you probably haven't thought about in, in a long time. And here's the question. Why are you here? And when I ask that, I don't mean like the, the existential question, you know, what's your purpose in life? My question is, is much more practical than that. Why are you here in this room on this day at this time? Now, however you would answer that question, I want you to know that we're, we're glad you're here. But I do want you to think about your answer to that question. It could be that you're here because it's Sunday and that's just what you do. It could be that you're here because you know if you weren't here, you'd spend the rest of the day uh, hearing your grandmother's voice echo through your mind telling you why you should have been here. Uh, it could be that you'd feel guilty if you weren't here. It could be that you're here to see who else is here. It could be that you're here so that the other people who are here could see you here. I mean, there's a lot of different reasons. Uh, some people are here because they want their kids to hear the same stories they heard when they were growing up. Uh, some of you are here because you like the music. Other people are here because the, the sermon makes them think. A few people are probably here because they've got questions and they're, they're looking for answers. So there are a lot of different reasons. And the truth is, for most of us, it'll probably be a, a combination of several different reasons that causes us to get out of bed on a Sunday, a cold Sunday, uh, and to come to this room at this time. So you can think about your reason for being here. And while you're thinking about that, I want you to turn to John chapter 6. John chapter 6. Today we're in week 4 of this uh, seven-part series. We're looking at seven individual stories that the Apostle John highlighted about miracles that Jesus performed, only rather than calling them miracles, he calls them signs. And that may not seem like it's a big deal, but it is an important distinction. A miracle is something that happens that you can't explain, but a sign is always something that points you to something else. So if you've been with us, we keep going back to the dictionary's definition. It says this, a sign is an object whose presence or occurrence indicates the probable presence or occurrence of something else. So another way to think about it is that the purpose of a sign is always to advertise something, to identify something, or to give direction to someone. So what John is doing in each of these seven stories is, is not just telling us about something cool that Jesus did. Instead, he's trying to tell us something about Jesus. And what you find in John chapter 6 is the story of the fourth sign, or we would call it the feeding of the 5,000. Now, if, there, if we had to pick a sign that would represent this story, it would look something uh, like this next sign that you're going to see on the screen. This is one that everybody's familiar with. If, if you grew up uh, going to church, this is a story you've heard repeatedly. I mean, if you're old enough, you saw the flannel graph version of this. You've seen the video version of this. If you have a children's story Bible at your house, you probably read that version to your kids. So this is a story that most people that grew up going to church have heard uh, multiple times. It's also a story that outside of the resurrection of Jesus, it's the only miracle that Jesus performed that's recorded in all four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. So it's interesting that all these years later, when these guys who were closest to Jesus sat down to write the story of their time with Jesus, this was a story that everybody was thinking about. This was on their minds. It's something that so captured their imagination that when it came time to tell their story, they couldn't help but include it. The problem, though, is that for some of us at least, we've heard this story so much that we think we know what it's about. And it usually goes something like this. So there was this huge crowd of hungry people and Jesus saw that they were hungry. And so being the kind and compassionate person that he was, he fed them and so we should go out and feed the hungry. Other times people read this story and they'll say, this is really a story about how Jesus takes what seems like it's not enough 
and he somehow prays over and multiplies it and he turns what's not enough into more than enough. So whenever you feel like you don't have enough, you should pray and God will make that more than enough. Now those two things are not necessarily wrong, but they are incomplete. They don't tell the whole story. When you slow down and you look at what actually happens in John chapter 6, rather than this being a cool story about how Jesus feeds hungry people or how he can take what seems like it's not enough and turn it into more than enough, at the most basic level, this is really a story about people who are following Jesus for the wrong reason. So with that in mind, here's what I want to do. We're going to we'll just sort of walk through this story. I'm going to point out a couple of things you may have not thought about before or maybe not thought about in a long time. Then I'm going to give you one big takeaway, and then I'm going to ask you one question, and then we'll be done. So if you have your Bible open, I want you to look at how this story unfolds, starting in verse 1. Sometime after this, Jesus crossed to the far shore of the Sea of Galilee, that is the Sea of Tiberias. And a great crowd of people followed him because they saw the signs he had performed by healing the sick. Then Jesus went up on a mountainside and he sat down with his disciples. The Jewish Passover festival was near. So by this point, Jesus' popularity has been growing at the same time the opposition to him from the Jewish religious leaders has been increasing exponentially. And so everywhere he goes, he's surrounded by people coming from all different directions who are trying to figure out who he is and what he's up to. So you know how exhausting that can be? So in order to take a break from that, Jesus escapes. He leaves Jerusalem. He crosses back over the Sea of Galilee, and he goes up on a mountainside to spend a few days with his closest friends, his disciples, to regroup. Unfortunately, though, for him, the people follow him. And one of the reasons they follow him is because of what John says in verse 4. I want you to look at it again. If, this is one of those verses, if you're not careful, you kind of read it and you say, well, okay, and you don't really let it sink in. Here's what he says. The Jewish Passover festival was near. Now, one of the things I hope you're picking up on as we work our way through these stories is that John was a master at inserting these little editorial comments that we kind of rush past, that when you really let them sink in, they change the whole complexion of the story. And this is one of those instances. The Jewish Passover was an annual celebration in which every, in which the Jewish people, they remembered what Moses had done in the Old Testament and how he led them out of Egyptian slavery. If you go back and you read the book of Exodus You can read that story. They escape Egypt, and they head towards the promised land. It was also one of the three Jewish festivals that every able-bodied Jewish person, especially the men, was expected to celebrate inside the city limits of Jerusalem. So wherever they were coming from, they would leave their home, and they would travel to Jerusalem to be there for the Passover festival. And historians tell us that every year in the weeks leading up to the Passover, there would be this this surge of of patriotism. Uh, Some scholars called it Jewish nationalism. And what would happen is, is this patriotism, this nationalism surge, it would be combined with this desperate sense of resentment at their current situation. And the reason they resented their current situation is because even as they gathered to remember how God had saved their ancestors from Egyptian slavery, they, the present generation, found themselves living under the oppressive authority of the Roman Empire. So it would be like celebrating Independence Day while you're living under the, the authority of a foreign ruler. And so when the people started to hear these stories about this this mysterious rabbi you know, who could turn water into wine, he could save people off their deathbed, he could help paralyze people walk again, that the wheels started to turn. And they started to think, you know, if he could do that, like if he could do those kinds of things, then I wonder if maybe he could help us defeat the Romans and give us our, our freedom back. And so, they set off in search of Jesus. And when they find him hanging out by the Sea of Galilee, it doesn't take long for the excitement to start to build and the 
the crowd to start to, to swell. Starts with a few dozen, then a few hundred, and next thing you know, you get this huge crowd of thousands of people all lined up just waiting for Jesus to say something or to do something. And it's at that point that, that Mark tells us in his telling the story that Jesus sees this opportunity and he begins to teach the people of gather. So it says like this in Mark 6, when Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. So he began to teach them many things. Now keep in mind that, that none of this was planned. So the people are, are completely unprepared. So as the hours pass by, the, the crowd starts to get hungry. And that's where John picks up the story and in verse 5, look at how he says this. When Jesus looked up and he saw a great crowd coming toward him, he said to Philip, where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? He asked this only to test him for he already had in mind what he was going to do. Philip answered him, it would take more than half a year's wages to buy enough bread for each one to have a bite. Now, some of you right now are planning your Thanksgiving meal. And if you haven't paid attention or if you haven't noticed, if you haven't been uh, grocery shopping in a while, then, then you know things this year are going to cost more than they, they did last year. And so people are having to make some tough decisions about the menu and the, and the guest list. It's like, hey, I know we usually have turkey, uh, but this year we decided to have hot dogs. And, uh, and I'm sorry we couldn't afford the buns, but we do have plenty of hot dogs. Or, uh, you know, I know we always invite your Uncle Johnny to eat with us, but I think we're just going to do like our immediate family this year, and, and you know, Uncle Johnny's kind of creepy anyway, so, so no great loss there. But just, just imagine what it would be like to feed a crowd of 5,000 people. And that, just keep in mind, that's just the men. That doesn't count the, the women and children, so you add them in, it's probably, probably 15,000. I did a little research this week, and I found that to cater a meal in 2022, according to Google, the national average, and again, this is going to sound high, but the national average is $70 per person. Now, the cheaper version is you can do a food truck, but that's still $35 per person. So you average those two together, let's just say it costs $50 a person. So $50, if you do the math on that, to, to feed a crowd of 5000 would be $250,000. Now, unless you won the Powerball last week or you've got an unbelievable job, that's an impossibility. So what Philip says in verse 7 is actually true. The, not only are there no restaurants and no options, the, they don't have any money. I mean, how are you going to feed a crowd that big with no options, no food, and no money? So I told you last week, as you work your way through these signs, they all follow the same storyline. I call it the, the sign storyline. And the details differ from story to story, but the basic pattern is, is almost always the same. It starts when you have some unsolvable problem. You know, what are we going to do? How are we going to fix this? And nobody has an answer. And then somewhere along the line, Jesus gets involved, and sometimes he's invited in, other times he invites himself, but, but he's always right in the middle of it. And then finally, it always ends with Jesus asking the people who were involved in the situation to do something that on the surface of it makes zero sense for them to do, but he asked them to do it as a demonstration of their trust in him. And that's exactly what happens when you get to verse 8. In this story, check out how this goes down. Another of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up. Here is a boy with five small barley loaves and two small fish, but how far will they go among so many? Jesus answered, have the people sit down. There was plenty of grass in that place, and they sat down. About 5,000 men were there. Jesus then took the loaves, gave thanks, and he distributed to those who were seated as much as they wanted. And he did the same with the fish. When they, all, when they had all had enough to eat, he said to his disciples, gather the pieces that are left over, let nothing be wasted. So they gathered them and filled 12 baskets with the pieces of the five barley loaves left over by those who had eaten them. Now, as you go through the story, three things just very quickly that you see that you have to understand if you want to understand what John's trying to draw, draw home here. 
So here, here's the first thing, if you're tracking with us, you have this, this unexplainable moment. So one of the things I hope you notice, uh, started to pick up on as we go through these stories, is that John never really tells us how Jesus does the things that he did. He just sort of says they happen, and it, it's okay, because even if he told us, we, we wouldn't understand it. But what he does tell us is that somehow Jesus takes what amounts to basically, you know, five kind of mini pancakes and two kind of fish sticks type things, and he prays over them, and he multiplies them, and he feeds this enormous crowd, and there's so much food that he sends the disciples out to, to gather up the leftovers. Now, if you're like me, you hear all that, you read that, and, and you probably have some questions like, how did he do that? And the answer is, I don't know. What did the food taste like after he multiplied? Again, we don't know. And what about the leftovers? I mean, why did they gather them up? And, and where did they take them? I mean, did they give them to somebody else? Did they eat them? I mean, there's all kinds of questions that come up that, that we don't know the answers to. And it, it really doesn't matter. I mean, if you wanted me to, I could speculate. And I could tell you what a lot of other people have said about those. But it, it really doesn't matter because the purpose of a sign is never the sign in and of itself. The purpose of a sign is always to point you to something else. So John's emphasis in this story is not how Jesus did this. It's what Jesus was trying to accomplish. And it's what happens after he does this that's most important. So what you see next in this story is a case of mistaken identity. This is so important. To make sense of what happens next in the story, you have to go back to what John said in verse 4 when he said the Passover was near. What that means is that everybody there who was a part of that crowd was already thinking about how God had used Moses in the Old Testament to deliver their ancestors from slavery while at the same time they were desperately hoping that God was going to send them another prophet, somebody like Moses, who would help them kind of do the, the same thing and defeat their enemies. So this was a story, you got to remember, this was a story they had heard all their lives. And now there's a big part of them that's hoping to relive at least part of the story. And to be clear, they had a good reason for hoping that because if you go back to Deuteronomy 18, Moses himself had told them that at some point in the future, there would be another prophet who would do something very similar. Here's the way Moses said it in Deuteronomy 18. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me, like him, from among you, from your fellow Israelites. You must listen to him. And so with all of that sort of swirling around in the back of their minds, they started to put the pieces together. They took this and they, heard, they took the stories about what Jesus had done and they were completely convinced that Jesus was the one that Moses had been talking about. So I want you to look at how this goes down. Look at verse 14. There's something really interesting. After the people saw the sign Jesus performed, they began to say, Surely, this is the prophet who has come into the world. Now, if you, in my translation, probably in yours too, that word prophet is capitalized. Who are they talking about? They're talking about Moses. They think this is Moses, or at least the person that Moses talked about has come, has finally arrived on the scene, who's going to lead them to freedom, help them escape the Roman, this Roman occupation, this Roman slavery, and give them their independence. Then look at what happens in verse 15. Jesus, knowing that they intended to come and make him king by force, withdrew again to a mountain by himself. You go back to the story of the Exodus. If you've read that, you may remember how God provided manna or bread from heaven to feed the people as they made their way from Egypt towards the promised land. And now they've just seen Jesus multiply the, the fish in the low. So that, that means the people in the crowd are even more convinced that this is the guy that Moses was talking about. So after all they've heard about Jesus and after what they've just experienced with Jesus, they're ready to make him the king. 
And you can almost imagine some of Jesus' like strongest supporters getting in his ear and saying, you know what, Jesus? Now's the time. Now's the time to launch your campaign. I mean, don't wait for the next election cycle. We've got to strike while the iron is hot. Our polling indicates you will never be more popular than you are right now. So if you're ever going to make a move, now's the time. But that's not what Jesus does. Instead of seizing that opportunity to declare his candidacy, Jesus separates from the crowd and he goes up on a mountain to escape them. Why did he do that? He did it because Jesus knew that the people in the crowd that day were obsessed with gaining political power and defeating their enemies. And Jesus knew his mission was a lot more important and a lot bigger and went a lot deeper than who was in office at any given time. Just as a side note, I told you earlier It's the only miracle that all four of the gospel writers, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they all choose, they all tell us some version of this story. And in each of their accounts, they all go out of their way to mention that there were 5,000 men in the crowd that day. And when you read it, it kind of seems oddly specific that each of them would decide not just to include but to emphasize that one detail and and you could read that and you could say hey that was just their way of saying this was this enormous crowd and to kind of impress you with the magnitude of the miracle but I think it's more than that one of the things that John's original readers would know that we don't know or that we've at least forgotten and because of the world that they lived in, and they would have been intimately familiar with this one little detail, that 5,000 men was the exact number of soldiers to have a fully formed Roman legion. So here you have this huge crowd of people, 5,000 men, enough to form a legion of soldiers, ready to make Jesus their king. They're ready to to march back around the Sea of Galilee, go back toward Jerusalem, picking up steam, probably adding men as they go. And then you remember what John said about the Passover being near. And you remember that every able-bodied Jewish man was already supposed to be heading toward Jerusalem. And it's not inconceivable that by the time Jesus and his new army arrived in the city, He could have had an army of 25 or 30,000 men ready to do battle in the street, ready to defeat the Romans and restore the nation of Israel. But rather than engaging in the battle and leading an army, Jesus does the opposite. He quietly slips away from the crowd that wants to make him king and he heads back across the lake. And that leads to the third thing you see, and that's a wrong motive. So Jesus separates himself from the crowd. John tells us that he he made his way back across the lake. That's the story that we're going to look at next week, so, so don't miss it. But the problem in this instance is that the people are not quite ready to give up on their dream of making him king. So, so rather than letting them go, what do they do? They, they chase after him. And the question is, why did they chase him? What is it that they're, they're after? They chased him because they wanted more stuff. They wanted more of what he could do. So when you get to verse 25, Jesus encounters this crowd a second time, and he, he calls them on it. Skip down to verse 25, and look what happens. When they found him on the other side of the lake, they asked him, Rabbi, when did you get here? And Jesus answered, very truly I tell you, <clears throat> you are looking for me. Not because you saw the signs I performed, but because you ate the loaves and had your fill. Do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For on him God the Father has placed his seal of approval. Here's the deal. Jesus knew something about them that they didn't know about themselves. And in fact, it's true not just of them, but it's true of us. And as soon as I say it, you're going to know instinctively 
that it's true because you've done it and so have I. Jesus knew that if we're not careful, we will spend our lives chasing after what he called food that spoils. And we've all done it. The people in that crowd that day were looking for their next meal. And you can understand that because they lived in a culture, food was sometimes hard to come by. But in our culture, it's different. But the, the principle is the same. Deep down inside, inside all of us, there is something within us that longs to be satisfied. If you were going to put a label on it, you could call it a hunger. And here's the thing about hunger. When you're hungry and you're looking for something to satisfy that hunger, if you get hungry enough, you'll eat almost anything in an effort to fulfill and satisfy that hunger. But make sure you understand, according to Jesus, what's true of physical hunger is even more true of spiritual hunger. No, no, we live in a world that says we're all we're basically told we're just, you know, physical bodies and we're enslaved to this, these unseen, you know, biological forces and we're slaves to our DNA. But the picture the Bible paints is that we are primarily spiritual beings who are temporarily housed within a physical body. And so what that means is that just like we have a physical hunger that needs to be satisfied in order for us to survive, there is a spiritual hunger that has to be satisfied in order for us to to thrive. And the problem though, and we're all guilty of this, is that we try to satisfy that spiritual hunger with what Jesus says is food that spoils. And if you thought about it hard enough and long enough, you could make your own list of all the things that you thought were going to satisfy that hunger only to discover probably within a very short amount of time that you were hungry again. So I mentioned earlier, one of the things I'm looking forward to in a couple weeks is our Thanksgiving meal. And I don't know how you guys do it. The way we do it has changed pretty dramatically over the last few years. But, but the menu pretty much stays the same. Now, the venue might change, but the menu is pretty much the same. You have turkey and ham and mashed potatoes and green beans, just all the stuff that you have. And there's usually some kind of dessert. And again, I don't know how you do it, but I've sort of perfected this process over the years that, that works for me. And some of you might want to write this down. This may help you. Uh, you get your plate for the first go round, right? So since we eat at lunchtime on Thanksgiving Day, I always skip breakfast. That's kind of the first step. Then you get your plate and you go through and you fill it up. And for me, the, the first plate is kind of a sampler platter, right? You get a little of this and a little of that. You try to get a little of everything. And then you go and, and as you eat through that first plate, and again, you might want to write this down, you use that as an opportunity to carefully evaluate all of your options. The goal is not to get full, the goal is to see what you want to get full on. So you kind of go through and you carefully evaluate, this is pretty good, this is not so good, this is great, I'm going to get more of this. So you kind of go through that first round, then you get your, your second plate. Now, again, I don't know how you do it, but here's what I do. I take the top four, maybe five options, the kind of the award winners from the first plate, and you go back and you fill that second plate with only the top four or five things. And then you sort of sit down, and that's when you hit another level. You know what I mean? You kind of eat, and, and you try to get, you know, full, and you're, you're doing your part. And you would think, like, after you had that second plate, that'd be a good time to stop, right? I mean, you would think, feel pretty good. My hunger's kind of, you know, satisfied for the moment. But don't do that. Go back a third time. And when you go back the third time, I, I don't know how you do it, but here's what I do. I always limit it to the top two things. So I've kind of worked my way through this pyramid, and you get down, and you've kind of got these two elite options, whatever they are, and then you just sort of dig into that third plate, and at some point during the, the third plate, what's going to happen is your, your hunger is going to move from, you know, satisfaction to saturation, you know what I'm saying? And you're going to think, I, I can't eat any more of this. So you get, do your best. And then if you're like me, maybe you go to the recliner 
And it's kind of gone from pleasure to pain at that point. You know what I'm saying? You're like, I'm not sure it's a great idea. I probably should have that third place. So maybe you kick back in the recliner. Maybe you get on the couch. You loosen your belt. Try to relax. Some people lay down on the floor, you know, try to, try to stretch it out, looking for some relief. And you, you reach that point. Sometime during that third place, you reach that point where you think, I am never going to eat again. And even the thought of taking another bite of anything kind of turns your stomach. You think there is no way. And that usually lasts for about three hours. And then the way I measure it, at halftime of the first football game, you're going to get up out of your chair, and here's what you're going to do. You're going to find yourself wandering back toward the kitchen. And you might even tell the members of your family hey, I'm going to go get something to drink. But everybody knows that's not what you're doing, right? And you know, but you walk in there and you're going to tell yourself, you know, I really shouldn't be hungry. But you are. Because that's the way appetites work. They are never fully and finally satisfied. And it works that way in every area. Money, jobs, careers, success, relationships, food, even our spiritual lives will work that way unless you consume the one thing that can fully and permanently satisfy you. So what you see here in John chapter 6 is not a cool story about how Jesus is compassionate and feeds hungry people. It's not that. And it's not a story about how Jesus can, you know, take what doesn't seem like enough and and pray and turn it into more than enough, although he can do that. Instead, what you see is a story with one big takeaway. And here it is. True satisfaction is found in who Jesus is, not what he does. It's who he is, not what he does. So you go through the Gospel of John. It's undeniable Jesus did some incredible things. Turns water into wine, uh, heals that royal official's son, clothes a paralyzed man, walk again. This story takes two small loaves or five loaves and two fish, and he somehow multiplies and frees this an enormous crowd. And as soon as he does it, everybody goes crazy. And you would have gone crazy too because nobody had ever seen anything like that. But the reason they went crazy was the wrong reason. They were obsessed with what Jesus could do rather than who Jesus was. And Jesus knows that, so I want you to look at what he says, verse 28. Let these words just sort of sink in. Here's what he says. Then they asked him, what must we do to do the works God requires? And Jesus answered, the work of God is this, to believe in the one he sent. So they asked him, what sign then Will you give that we may see it and believe you? Again, this obsession with the signs. What will you do? Our ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness as it is written. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. Then check out this. Jesus said to them, very truly I tell you, it is not Moses who has given you the bread from heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is the bread of that comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Sir, they said, always give us this bread. And then here's the clincher, verse 35. Then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry. And whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. See, they thought that what they needed was a political leader who could gather an army, march on Jerusalem, defeat the Romans, and restore power to the nation of Israel. And along the way, if he could provide a few free lunches and heal a few sick people and create enough, turn enough water into wine so that everybody could always have enough to drink, that was just icing on the cake. They were obsessed with what they thought Jesus might be able to do for them when the whole time the reality of this story and really the whole point of John's gospel is not what Jesus might be able to do, but who Jesus 
is. So you get to the end of the gospel, John chapter 20. He said it like this. Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God. And that by believing, you may have life in his name. Make sure you catch that. According to John, what Jesus did and the miracles he performed were never the main thing. They were always meant to serve as signs that would point us to who he is. So with that in mind, I want to close today by asking you a question. And it's the same question we started with. Why are you here? Are you here because of what you think Jesus might be able to do for you? Or are you here because of who he is? I hear that and you might think, what's the difference? But understand, there's a huge difference. Because if you think, if you're here because of what you think Jesus might be able to do for you, and how he might make your life easier, and how he might uh, help you fulfill all your dreams, you know what's going to happen the first time that doesn't happen? You know what's going to happen the first time somebody hurts your feelings, or Jesus asks you to do something that you really don't want to do, and serve in some way that you really don't want to serve? You're going to do what the people in this story did. You keep reading this chapter, you get down to verse 66. Here's what it says. From this time on, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. Why? Because they were obsessed with what he might do for them rather than who he was. And when you're following Jesus with the wrong motive, it doesn't take much for you to, to turn back. It doesn't take much for you to move on. But, If you can somehow reach a point where you're following Jesus, not because of what he might do, but because of who he is, that changes everything. So with that in mind, I want to ask you again, why are you here? I want you to stand with me. As as we close, we're going to sing uh, two final songs together. And as we do, if you want to pray with somebody, if you have questions about what it would look like for you to to follow Jesus because of who he is, if you want to pray about some particular issue, if you have questions about membership or baptism, whatever it is, Dave and I will be here, Johnson, we'd be glad to to pray with you or talk with you as long as you need. Just meet us on this, this front row.